pray with me our most gracious and kind Heavenly Father we're so grateful we are able to come together in this capacity to with Christians of like mind to study your word sing praises unto thee and partake of the Lord's Supper our Heavenly Father we ask you to be with all those that are sick and afflicted all those that are having procedures all those that are bereaved at this time comfort and guide them as only you can. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to thee that you sent Jesus to the earth, that he walked as man, suffered, bled, and died, and rose on the third day that we could have hope of life eternal. We ask you to be with all the elders and the deacons of this church, help them to continue to spread the gospel, and to that we can one day live in your home. We ask you to brief Brother Mike as he brings a lesson this morning. May he have ready recollection of what he has to say to us and may we hear as you would have us to. Be with uh, Brother Robert as he labors with the church and with the teenagers. We ask you to be with the men and women in the military. We ask you to help them to stay safe, comfort their families, be with uh, the leaders of this country. May they look to you for guidance. As may we, will you continue with us through this service, God, guard, and direct us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Remember. Remember how he broke the loaf made from golden wheat and said, This is my body. Take this bread and eat. Remember how the sunripe grapes taken from the vine became a cup of blessing. Take and drink this wine. Remember how a cross of wood became a symbol of Christ's giving of himself to us the greatest kind of love. Remember Jesus' love for you today as you receive his bread of life, his cup of grace. Remember and believe. In Mark 14, 22 through 25, and while they were eating, he took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take it, this is my body. And when he had taken a, cu the cu a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I shall never again drink of the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Shall we pray for the bread? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for the many blessings and for this time that we can come and partake of the bread, which to the Christian is Christ's body. And as we partake, may we look back and see that cross. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue our thanks for the juice, the fruit of the vine, which to the Christian is Christ's blood. And as we partake, may we look back and see the suffering of Christ and partake in a way that will be pleasing in thee. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll now pray for our giving. Uh, of course, there's a black box in the foyer that you can put your giving in or you can pay online. The Heavenly Father, we thank you for our many blessings and we thank you for our homes, our jobs, and we want to this time give back to you and that the work here at Farmington will continue to grow. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. 
He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemies came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, let it gather in the weeds you root up uh, the wheat along with them. Let both, the gr let both grow together until the harvest, and at the harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first, and bind them in bundles and be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. In your Bibles, I want you to be turning to the book of Revelation chapter 3. <clears throat> you will notice up there, starting at the bottom on the left-hand side, we have Ephesus. Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum were on a main Roman mail route. They were also parts of seaport. Anytime you find a seaport, you're going to find commerce. You're going to find a lot of traffic. You're going to find a lot of variety. And so you have those churches. Last week, we dealt with Thyatira, and today we're going to deal with Sardis. If you look at Sardis, uh, what you find is a tremendous Acropolis. And if you were to stand here on the plain and look up, up at the very top, you have Thyatira. Thyatira was surrounded by three walls. They thought that they were impregnable. In about A.D. 17, an earthquake destroyed it. And Tiberius, out of his grace, decided to reimburse taxes and not tax, and they rebuilt it, but obviously not to the beauty that it was before. I don't know if you have read or studied the temples, the rebuilding of the temples, but after the rebuilding by Herod of the temple, the Jews that went back were so disappointed in what they saw, they hung their stringed instruments in the trees and let the wind play their instruments. They could not bring themselves to worship God in such a building. They were so disappointed. And so here you have this, this great city, three walls, and it was surrounded by a moat. And so they just thought we're impregnable, which means what? If you don't think folks can attack you, what will you do? Jesus starts his words with, it's time to wake up. Don't we become apathetic, relaxed? You're put up there to be on guard, and you're thinking, no one can get up here, and you go to sleep. And Midian climbed that mountain and penetrated the city, and it happened twice. It let them know, you've taken some things for granted. Husbands, we would do well to listen to this message of taking things for granted. Our wives. Amen? I'll admit it, will you? Amen? Goodness gracious. I'll take you home. If you can't ride with your wife, there are things that we, you know, once we get the trophy and we hang it on the wall, then we're through. We would do well, husbands, not to take things for granted so the wall cannot be scaled. And so this is the setting of the book of Revelation to Sardis. Let me just give credit here to the yard and the garden. Someone came down and was working yesterday in the yard and in the garden. We would ask Joshua and Caleb when they were just 
small. Where are you going? And they said, we're going out to play in the yarden. And I said, what's a yarden? And they said, the yard and the garden, it's a yarden. And so thank you for working on the yarden. Turn your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 3. And let's notice what the Lord, and I realize he is writing to the angels, the message to be delivered to the church. It wasn't for the messenger, Anglos, uh, one who carries a messenger. Um, and so John writes here, <clears throat> John in a vision. He is writing to a church that is plagued like the other churches of Asia, in that Rome had done something for them. And in response, these cities would build their monuments. They would build their idols to the ones who called themselves gods, but were not Roman rulers. And so the church was in a world that was struggling. It was struggling between society, just like we do today, Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter, I mean, Matthew, um, John chapter 7, 17, and the church, our, our ethics, our morals. And how do we live those and please the Lord? And so he is writing to brethren that have been called out of an adulterous world and trying to get them to please the Lord. And brethren, one thing that we ought to constantly ask ourselves, whether it's through the day, or whether it's when we pillow our heads at night, has my day brought glory and honor to the Lord? That, that ought to concern us, not if we're getting ahead in the world. And so the book is written, Let's begin reading in verse 1 of the book of Revelation, chapter 3. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write. Now remember, John is on the Isle of Patmos. He is in a vision. He is receiving visions and revelation. The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Who is the authority here? The one who holds the seven spirits, which is God. This is God's message to a group of his children. Now, last week we dealt with God does not want to salvage. He doesn't want to throw away. He wants to redeem. Notice again, one of the hardest lessons for parents, parents with young kids that are growing, is when they leave home. It is a very difficult time. Most of the time, you will not say, well, we're empty houses, let's celebrate, let's take a Caribbean cruise. What is on your mind is, and this, is, this has been stressed by Robert, it's been stressed in family ministry. All right, you've spent all this time, you have taken your children to worship, you've taken your children to Bible class. Will that hold up after they get away from mom and dad's eyes? It's a hard lesson. Once they leave and they get out of your sight, are they going to be faithful to the Lord? To the parents, and as an older parent who still parent my 40-year-old children, good parenting most of the time pays off. No matter the wildernesses, no matter the dry times, 
good Christian living in front of your children pays off. And so at what point in your life do you think, I'm out of the sight of God? In each one of these letters, Jesus is saying, God is saying, I know. Now, I don't know where the imbalance came in in religion. About God's grace and us working the work of God and his son Christ. There is a terrible imbalance there. In each one of these cases, God didn't just say, I know you, I know where you worship. He said, I know your works. There are two types of works. There is maintenance where the church spends all of its time trying to please every bellyaching Christian there is on earth. I was talking to a good sister this morning about my clocks. And as I looked around, I've got them that go back to 1812. I have one from 1812 that has never, ever been worked on, and it still runs. That kind of reminds you of Jack Carter, doesn't it? I've got other clocks in there that after some tweaking, you wind them up or you pull the chains every day. You've got some that you can wind and it will run for over a month. And by the way, if it doesn't have a key, it's not a clock in my books. And I got to thinking, this is almost like the church. Some of us have got to be tweaked every day. Some of us got to be tweaked every month. Some of us in great relationships with the Lord don't have to be tweaked at all. We just run and keep on running. Jesus said, I know your works, your deeds. On the final day, brethren, there are going to be two books opened. Do not deceive yourself. We are told that on that day, there are going to be some that are going to say, Matthew 7, at the end of Jesus teaching on the parables, there are going to be some who say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name, have we not done many mighty works? And in thy name, have we not even raised the dead? And Jesus will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I know you not. James says in James chapter 1 that we are to be doers. If I'm doing something, I am working. Be ye doers and not what? Here is only, notice, deceiving your own self. What is a hearer? A hearer is a Sunday morning, go to Bible class, go to worship, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the Bible says you've deceived yourself. Your deeds are not worked out or your mouth is not backed up by your deeds. And so to the church at Sardis, God says, I know your works. Just look at the word. Jesus went about doing good. And as being stated, for doing good, he was put on a cross. The greatest good that he did, Hebrews chapter 2, was to save us from our sins. I know your works. If we have hearing and no doing, Satan has deceived us. Wake up. If he's telling them to wake up, 
what can you reasonably assume he'd been uh, been doing? Sleeping. Wake up. Take note. This ought to capture our attention. He said, I know your works. You have a reputation. Some of them will say a name of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. You have a reputation with who? God's not interested in the reputation. He's interested in character. Good character will have a good reputation. But you have a name. That you are awake, that you are doing good, but he said you're dead. And only God can say that. Only God could stand here now and start pointing one by one by one by one and say, you need to be careful about this. This one's going to get you. When I think about this, I think about the church. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul said to them, because they were not discerning the Lord's Supper, they were not examining the reason that they were doing, he said, because you have not discerned it or rightly uh, weighed it out and come to conclusions, realize what had happened, many of you are asleep, and some of you were dead. They walked into worship, they did what they were commanded, and they walked out of worship, but the Bible says that many of them were dead and asleep. If we're not careful, we can get so relaxed and so complacent with where we are, we don't think anyone can scale the wall. Who's at the door? Who is sitting at the door waiting to come in? His name is Satan. And he's going to creep in where I am the weakest. He will destroy me or he'll put me to sleep. We keep reading. <clears throat> They had a reputation, they had a name for being alive, but they were dead. Wake up and strengthen. Have you ever been to a funeral? And halfway, I ain't through, Dale. Dale's just shaking his head. Have you ever been to a funeral and halfway through the funeral, the box opens and he sits up? You ever been to one of those, Dale? I used to work for a taxi, I mean, for a, uh, the mortician in Tullahoma, Tennessee. And when you make your initial cuts to do the embalming, it is not unusual for a person to sit up. Uh, I don't know how long it took him to find me, but it happened. You... You find something or a person or an animal that's, that's dying. It's on its way out. Uh, Mark knows this, Eddie, Charles. How many calls have you been to where the person was in the process of dying and you do the CPR and you do all that to keep them awake, to try and wake them up and get them alive? And here's what Jesus is saying. There is an obituary being written, but we're going to delay the funeral. There were some that were dead. There were some that were asleep. But the Lord says, wake up and strengthen. There again is that reclamation. God wants to reclaim his creation. He does not want to discard it. 
strengthen what remains and is about to die. I'm 65 years old, and I never knew one person could have so many doctor's appointments in all my life. And if Social Security pays for it or Medicare pays for it, they're going to do it whether you need it or not. And so at 65, we try to get healthy. We take handfuls of stay alive a day pills. God was able to look. Doctors are able to look and they're able to say, Brandon, if you do this, it will help. If you don't do this, it's going to be a funeral. And God looks and he sees the dying. And he said, do this. There's still life in the church. Let's hold off on the obituary. For I have not found your works completed in the sight of God. Perfect. You've still got work to do. Remember then what you received and what you heard. Isn't this what Paul says to Timothy? Talking about give the more earnest heed to the things that you have heard, lest they slip away. Mark's never done this, but I have. I tied my boat up on Silver Springs River, or the Rainbow River, which flows into Lake Russo. I thought I tied it right. When I went and I parked my car, came back, my boat was going down Rainbow Springs. They now do have a trolling motor that will bring it back. And this is what he's talking about. You tie the rope tight so what you have seen and what you have heard doesn't slip away. Church, wake up. There's still life here, and I want life in the church. Remember then what you have received and what you have heard. Keep it and repent. Brethren, we live in an age, of, really not, it's not new. After 200 years of the establishment of the church, it was getting corrupt because man decided to make God in man's image and not versa, vice versa. We're facing that today. We're asking members, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? What we ought to be asking is, God, what do you want of us? What changes do I need to make? And so the church at Sardis was facing those problems. Keep it and repent. And if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief in the night. And you will not know of what hour I will come against you. Let me give you one of Satan's biggest secrets. You do something that is wrong. And because you're not struck dead, you don't come down with liver problems or heart attack, you think you got away with it. No. Satan doesn't just want to destroy Will Dockery. Satan will wait and allow that sin in his life to hurt himself, his wife, his children, everybody that he has influence on. That's when Satan's coming, when he can do the most damage. And Christ is saying, if you don't wake up, I'm going to come as a thief in the night. That doesn't mean that God's sneaking around. 
It means that he comes as a thief in the night, not to him, but to us. Brethren, it amazes me when this nation goes through something that's catastrophic, how it fills the church for a week or two. And then the world thinks, well, we got away with that one and they're gone again. Wake up, church. If you don't wake up, I'll come as a thief in the night. You who have still a few names inside us, people that have not soiled their garments, their white garments, the garment that God gives us, the garment of righteousness, there's still good going on at the church at Sardis. And they will walk with me in white. For they are worthy. Brethren, stop Satan telling you that you're not worthy. Because of what Christ has done for us, we are worthy. We are made right, perfect, and whole in the presence of God Almighty through Jesus Christ, his Son. He gave us his righteousness. We give him our sins. We are a people that are worthy. We are God's children, joint ears with Jesus Christ. And so we get to walk with Jesus. Another promise that is made, I will never blot his name out of the book of life. The second book that is there on judgment, not only is the book of deeds, it is the book of life. God will open that book and look for your name. And if your name and my name is not in that book of life, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I know you not. Brethren, to the overcomer, to the one who will wake up, hold on until he does come to what he has given us. We are given the robe of righteousness, and he will not blot our name out of the Lamb's book of life. I will confess his name before the Father and before the angel, he that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. It may be time that we go and we order from Dr. Jesus, the great physician, some spiritual hearing aids so that we can hear what God is trying to say to the church. The question that I have, what are we holding on to? What are our good works? What are our deeds? And if God would come back in our lives, would he find our name in the Lamb's book of life? If you have uncertainties, go to God. Pray to God. If you're not a child of God, your name has never been written in the Lamb's book of life. We become children of God by crucifying the flesh, Galatians 2.20, putting Christ on in the watery grave of baptism, Romans chapter 6. He raises us up. He gives us the strength, writes our name in the Lamb's book of life to walk in a newness of life. If that has been weak in your life, repent and be restored. God wants to reclaim, not to discard. Well, together we stand a while we sing.
Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning with great joy. We're just so wonderful to be together as brothers and sisters, sharing our lives, sharing everything that we have, and, and, and more particularly sharing the story of Jesus. As he came to this earth and he taught us, he began the, his kingdom, his church, and uh, our goal, Father, is to have our names in that precious book of life. Uh, just help us as we teach the word, help us as we lean on each other, encourage one another uh, to keep our names in that book. Well, Father, we come before your throne asking for uh, supplications for Keith Doty's dad as he had that surgery, and for Sean Brown undergoing such a terrible radiation regimen, for Tilly as she uh, is going, undergoing chemo treatments, for Tara Cunningham's grandfather, for Ruth Hughes' sister-in-law, for Rick Harmon as he has his surgery, for Leslie as she's going to MD Anderson, for Julie Harmon as she's going uh, to get to uh, the Mayo Clinic. Be with Jimmy as he has some things done for his self. Be with Eileen Beckett. Father, there are others I know who are in need of you right now, both from physical standpoint, spiritual, otherwise. Just be with us all as we pray together to your name. We, we honor you, Father, as being our great high God, and we know you're listening. We do. We have every faith that we can in you. Father, be with us now as we leave this place, and be with us until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen.